Welcome to the House by the Video Store video blog. I'm William and with me today is... Derek. And we'll be talking about the 1994 film, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, the seventh movie in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, although it's non-canonical since it's a very meta movie that like acknowledges that the prior movies were movies. Uh, so this movie came out in 94, which was two years before Wes Craven put out Scream, which was a huge success. And this movie was not as much of a success at the theater, although now if you look back at it, it's one of the more well-regarded movies in the franchise. Uh, for most people, it's the original movie, uh, part three, The Dream Warriors, and then this one in terms of the ones people like from the series overall. Yeah, I actually like this one. The, uh, the first one is my favorite, but this one actually, after watching it, yeah. is probably my second favorite, or maybe... J I don't know, I actually almost kind of enjoyed it more than the original. Well, and one thing, too, that has to be said is if you haven't watched at least the first one and most likely the third one, like, this movie will mean nothing to you. Like, if you're not aware of the... <laughs> if you haven't watched... I mean, who would watch the seventh movie in a series anyway without having seen the prior ones? Without, you know, being aware of the prior ones, this one wouldn't land as well if you weren't a fan of just the movie series in general. Um, but, you know, this one has all the cast from the original in it. And, you know, just kind of a brief synopsis. It's about, you know, the actress, um, Heather Loggenkamp, who played Nancy, uh, starts experiencing, like, the, you know, Freddy coming into the real world as they're talking about making a new movie. And then just kind of comments on, you know, like, the, the, the series in general and, like, a lot of the meta aspects of it. And it has, you know, like, all the cast in there. So it has, like, Robert England as Robert England and as Freddy. Yeah. Wes Craven as Wes Craven. Um, and then, you know, it's, it also has, um, a small child in it, which is, which is kind of annoying. That was the weakest part of the movie is a child aspect. Like, you know, we're just kind of doing full spoilers too, right? Yeah. So yeah. at this point, you know, it's full spoilers. It's a movie from 1994. <laughs> well, the funny so. thing is like when her husband dies, she could just like gave a shit list. She's like, she yeah. only cared that it was Freddy that did it yeah. or like a claw or something. She didn't necessarily have that much of a reaction to him being he's dead. Like, oh, okay. He's dead. Oh man. He got clawed. Shit. And then at the end of the movie, when they like get out of the Freddy world and they find the script from Wes Craven, like thanking um, her for playing Nancy one more time and stopping Freddy. Like, it didn't say anything like, sorry, your husband died yeah. and your child's father's dead. It's you like, know. Eh, you know. But it was kind of an interesting twist because, like they said, from what I got from it was, like, Freddy was just, like, an evil entity and the reason why this is happening was, like, the original movies contained him. Yeah, it's like an evil entity that latches on to stories and stays in the stories while they're ongoing. So the idea was kind of like once they stopped making the movies and you know, like they did the the Freddy's Dead, then the character was kind of unleashed and out of the movies and trying to cross over into the real world. And one thing too, though, I do like this movie is it really captured like the feeling of the first one and a little bit. Of, although the second one wasn't very good, yeah, they still had like that good dream feel to it where it just felt weird and it kind of got that feeling toward the end of the movie. Yeah, but there's a lot of parts that didn't contain Freddy. At all, it was more just like a lot of just the vibe it was more of the the pusher than it actually was Freddie being on screen doing anything. Well, and two the the on screen presence of Freddie in this movie because he's only really in the movie for a little bit because um, a lot of it's just like a claw or earthquakes. So there's a little bit of you know like just kind of falling around a house in this one. Um, but the, the version of Freddy in this is much closer to the first movie yeah. and what Wes Craven's intention was for the character, for him to just kind of be like a silent stalker who's supposed to be scary versus the later iterations of him in the sequels where he's, you know, like knocking off all kinds of one-liners well, and quips and jokes. Except for like the tongue part at the end, especially because <laughs> yeah. he wraps his tongue around, uh, what was the main character's name again? Um, uh, well, I guess Nancy yeah, or Heather. Nancy. Okay, well, Nancy. At that point, she was Nancy. Yeah. Wraps his tongue around Nancy, and then her son comes to the rescue and, like, stabs him in the tongue. Yeah. So he rips his tongue across the knife, and they push him in the fire pit, and he kind of rob zombies it. Yeah. While he's sitting in the fire, and he's got, like, the forked tongue. Well, and two, this one returns to the obsession of, like, one of Freddy's main powers being able to stretch his arm. Yeah. <laughs> like, of all the things he could do, he stretches his arms out, which I guess, you know, might have just been a throwback to the, the scene from the first movie, more so than, um, you know, using the technology available at the time. Um, and this movie did have a very tiny bit of CGI notice when rewatching it. it. But it wasn't like 
Mortal Kombat bad. It was. It was it like was a three. Good. It was like a three second clip yeah. when when Heather Nancy is falling into the Freddy world. Well, not just that too though, but and the then, point when her husband was driving back and the claw was coming through the seat. Yeah. Oh bit. yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh, could see like the kind of claws like going through the material. Yeah. But it wasn't like reptile Mortal Kombat bad. It was not great, but it didn't like. It's it's relatively you know, easy to overlook it since yeah. it wasn't a key part of the movie. They didn't, um, yeah, they didn't use it a whole lot, so it wasn't, you know, too too noticeable. And too, like we have to mention, like since the fact is this movie was a meta commentary on the movie itself, it had a lot of the people who were involved with the you know the behind the scenes aspect of it. So some of the acting isn't super great. Right. Was Craven's acting in it wasn't <laughs> the best? You know, uh, I mean it wasn't bad, but now Robert England was kind of the first part. He was like, I don't want. It was like a, kind of like a. Like a Jerry Springer type talk show. I don't know if Jerry Springer, yeah, but, but it was just like he came out and was acting like Freddie and going in the crowd and running around. And then he had one other small bit where he wasn't in makeup, and that was really about as much as he had as being himself. Yeah. Uh, but it was yeah. kind of interesting that he was even in there. You know, but it, yeah. this was kind of reminiscent to like movie Bryce Kirby did later on, Scream 3, because kind of the same storyline almost. You know, a little bit different, but same concept. While they're making the movie, killings happen that are related to the movie. Yeah. Uh, not exactly the same, but it was kind of maybe a retreading of something that he liked, but maybe wasn't, like you said, maybe wasn't successful at the time. Well, I think so. that with, with Scream, with Wes Craven's A New Nightmare, uh, I think that, it, you know, it did okay at the box office. It only ended up making, I have to look, but like $14 million at the U.S. box office which was one of the lowest grosses, I think the lowest gross of the series. Uh, but that was also because that was in the early 90s when horror had kind of hit a rough patch and nothing yeah. was doing that great. You also had Jason Goes to the Hell that came out and didn't do very well. Uh, and you had a lot of the franchise, kind of a lot of different franchises saying their low points. You had um, Halloween 5, it came out in 89, <laughs> and they didn't make another one until 96. So you had like a kind of a dead period. And this is one of those franchise movies that actually really did try something new. It wasn't just... The, you know, the seventh sequel in the series, it was, you know, a movie that kind of stands on its own because it's not really in the canon of the other movies because it all just agrees that they were a movie. Yeah, I think you could probably watch this, though, and not having seen the first one with Nancy or the third one and still enjoy it. Yeah. But it helps to know what the storyline is, but you kind of get the general gist of it just by what they're talking when about. When you have to know who the characters are, too, like when um, Nancy's talking to the actor, I believe his name is John Saxon, that played her dad in the original film. And then at some point in the movie, as the, the lines between movie and reality blur, she refers to him as dad. No, no, no. He and refers to her as Nancy Don, first. And then she refers to him as dad. Yeah. Like, And it's kind of hard to tell if she's just going along with it, just to make it easier if she, you know it's starting to bleed over to everybody. Yeah. And I think she was still aware of, you know, that wasn't right. But... Uh, so, you know, it was a movie that tried something different, which is kind of rare in these franchises. And it was, too, they got Wes Craven back. He hadn't been involved with the series. He directed the first one, and he helped co-write the third one. But then he hadn't really been involved with it beyond that. So to get him to come back for the seventh movie in the series is kind of, you know, unheard of. So they tried to do that with John Carpenter for Halloween H2O, and he said no. <laughs> Which, you know, based on how those movies turned out, wasn't the worst decision for him. No, I think, you know, it's a little bit different. H2O, I remember being really good when I was young, and I watched it again, I was like, eh. Well, it kind of goes back to the whole, you know, so Wes Craven, so you had New Nightmare. Had New Nightmare been made three years later, I think it could have been a, a much larger box office success, because Scream kind of pioneered the self-referential meta horror movie being a huge box office draw, because not that it was the first one to have done it, Scream, but it was one of the first hugely successful movies to acknowledge the rules of horror, that horror movies exist, that all these franchises are out there. Um, I mean, it's kind of like how in zombie movies, nobody references like, oh, it's like <laughs> Night of the Living Dead. I mean, so this yeah. was kind of like with Scream, it was kind of the first big hit movie that recognized that, you know, that all these movies are franchises and their rules. So I think if New Nightmare came out three years later, it could have been a much larger hit because when Scream came out, then you saw the Scream sequels. The I Know What You Did Last Summer, then you also saw Halloween H2O. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of got revamped, and like this one came out, like you said, maybe missed it the came mark. Out 90, it came out in 94. If it yeah. hit 97, it would have been a different story. Yeah. But I do think it was a really good movie. I, I think it was probably one of the better in the, in the franchise. Definitely better than any of the Halloweens from 2 on. You know, Friday 13th, at some point, those are all on the same level, I think. You know, there's not, it's all the same story. 
You yeah, know? I mean, I think with those, you kind of have some sequels that people don't like. Like, Five is kind of one, like the um, the new chapter from yeah. Friday the 13th. It's not super highly regarded. But a lot of those movies, like the, the qual, like, well, then, like the later sequels, like Jason Goes to Hell and Jason Takes Manhattan. <laughs> but the ones before that are all kind of interchangeable and in quality yeah. level. Like, Jason Lives is fun. It's much fun. It's much more fun than Part Five. But part four is good. So, but in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, they all made a lot of money. Yeah. Aside from kind of a new nightmare, which was one of the more original which, entries. Yeah, which like two. If you go back and watch it. Mm, so two, two is a movie that was an experimental movie, and it was a movie that had a lot of subtext about <laughs> coming out as a gay teen. Yeah, definitely. That yeah, was, you definitely get that from when you that watch something it. retroactively. Everyone says like, oh, okay, yeah, but at the time, I don't think it was as overt that they were doing that. Yeah. And it was also the one where Freddy really didn't do much. He only kind yeah. of did anything at the end. He cooked people in a pool and everybody was just... Yeah. yeah, but they didn't all die, though. No, they it, just yeah, made it hot and they yeah, got yeah. out of the water. Yeah, and then it was over. Everybody was like, okay, time to go home. So, like, all right. So, um... So one I, other thing I did like in that movie, though, is is right before she went to Freddy's world, she went in the house, and it kind of threw back to the original one because yeah, was, she walked in and watched the original movie. Yeah. But that's almost kind of a throwback to the original movie when like Johnny Depp was sitting there watching Evil Dead. Yeah. I like that a little bit. The TV's like it had some good Dreamland sequences. There's just dream feels to it for a lot of the movie, which I did enjoy. Because I think that's one thing that they do well in that franchise is make things feel kind of surreal. Yeah. And I think this one did that really well. I think that was a bigger driving force of the movie is you know because a lot of at some point you're wondering what was actually real and or was she crazy? You know. Yeah. So I was just trying to figure that out because this has a real vibe. And they redid the scene from the original one where the girl went up on the wall. Yeah. You know, and that was another good scene because remember, like, everybody in the hospital staff walked in and watched it happen. Yeah. Uh, what was that character's name? Um, Babysitter. Is I it Julia? Her name. Yeah. Correctly, so. Maybe. Just a small tidbit. She is in the Scream TV series <laughs> that Wes Craven's only involvement with was being an executive producer before he passed away. Yeah. Um, so this movie is definitely something that... I recommend going back and taking a watch. It's on Netflix Watch Instant. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's like the first one, the second one, and this one are on Netflix currently. So you get to watch the first one, which is the best, and then this one, which falls for most people somewhere like two or three in the series. But definitely ahead of its time. Had it came out a few years later, it could have been a much larger hit. But luckily, it exists, and we can watch it. So I think that brings this discussion to a close. Thanks for watching.